Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And behold, the star went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Good morning, everybody. Great to have you here. Merry Christmas. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here. And it is a joy to have you here today especially because some of you swam in through the parking lot. So we want to thank you for showing up today. You're the real Christians. We know this because of the weather. So thank you for joining us today. You came on a special day for many reasons. Uh, wow, the, the choir. Can you give them one more hand clap? I mean, they just crushed it. These are some of the new things we're so excited about next year of having some special elements during our service to really enhance the worship experience. And today was one of them. And we're, gonna, we're just going to keep climbing. Hey, I, I want to do two quick things. One is, hey, we'd like to let you know what happens first service. In first service, there were two people that gave their hearts to Jesus. And so I think that's a point of celebration. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are your family members that sometimes crossing paths you don't get to see because you're in and out, but two hands came, uh, lifted their hands to receive Jesus Christ, and that is what the day is all about. Second is today is my man, my pastor, and Miss Liz, pa Pastor Jason and Liz. Today is their anniversary weekend. They could be anywhere this weekend, but they're here worshiping with us. Would you give them a hand clap? Come on, give it up for them. If you're looking for ideas, my man loves steak, burn steakhouse, Charlie's, anything awesome, hook him up. Today is their weekend, uh, this week, and their anniversary, and so we honor you guys. We love you guys. Hey, today's great. We're, we're in part two today of a series uh, about worshiping the king, Worship the king, a Christmas series, and if you've missed any part, last week, let me bring you up to speed. Last week, Pastor Jason introduced us, and the whole idea was worship is war on our circumstances, that God just shows up, and he does. When you start worshiping, he shows up, and he does what he does best by working the miracles and does the heavy lifting. But if you missed it, check out the podcast, check out online, because you don't want to miss these series, because they just build week after week. And today, we're going to kind of jump into a little bit more of the Christmas story. But hey, look, how many of you guys are done Christmas shopping? Anybody? Anybody done Christmas shopping? We hate your guts. Everybody look around. Point your attention towards them. No, good job. Great job. Uh, Amazon is beautiful this year. Utilize it because they come to you. Just make sure you have a camera on your front porch because you don't know if you're going to get it. You know what I'm saying? And so good for you. Hey, growing up, show of hands, how many of you guys had a manger in your house, like a nativity scene in your house? Or maybe you went and saw a live nativity like I did. I grew up in a Catholic church when I was young. We'd always go see this live nativity. And look, the, the whole thing as a kid, you're just waiting to see if these animals are going to cooperate. And they never do. And it's a lot of fun. But hey, we had one nativity in our house that looked like this. Anybody have one of these little precious moments? How cute, right? A little precious moments action. One of these guys uh, here, I as a kid got a hold of and Started playing with my G.I. Joes and things, and one of these guys lost a head. That's all I'm saying. And I got whooped. I got whooped from my mom on Christmas season for breaking the nativity scene. But, hey, I found some fun pictures of some nativities. Maybe you've had some like this. Maybe this is the one at your house. <laughs> Look at that. Look at baby Jesus. Right? Little puppy dog Jesus. These guys are just begging. There's a table here filled with, like, roast beef and steak, and they're just waiting for scraps. Look at them. Yep, right along, we got some cats. Maybe you're a cat fan. This cat, look at these eyes are dilated like it's going to eat Jesus. This cat is definitely filled with demons. Gonna, yep, this maybe it's a, maybe you're a, you're part of the rebellion. Yep, yep, we've got some fans. Look, if you notice Jesus, go back. Jesus was Yoda. <laughs> they put a little baby Yoda. Hey, check out this next one. I mean, what's going on with Ricky Bobby was wrong. That's not 8.6 ounces. That's for sure. That is a massive Jesus. Next one. I mean, that's just gross, isn't it? Like, who does that? I mean, wh and what is that? What is that even made of? I, I, look at this hat. What is that? I don't even want to know. Hey, this is for all the progressive families out there. Amazon, wise men, selfie with Jesus. We would all do that, let's be honest. This guy's just by himself over here. Pretty funny, huh? Okay, next one. It's just an average nativity. Take a good look at it. But you did not know this. Boom, check out this next one. Will Smith was in that nativity. 
Look at that. The Fresh Prince of Nazareth right there. He's just hanging out. But look, today I want to focus on this last slide. And this, it's what we think are these three guys here. The Bible uh, describes them as the magi or the wise men. And so today I want to kind of dive into this story and unpack what it means to worship God in a significant way here and there. So, hey, grab your worship guide. In there is uh, some notes. So you can follow along. It's on the screens. But go to Matthew chapter 2 if you have a Bible. Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to jump in. Here's how we're going to do this today. We're going to read through the whole text. And then we're going to circle back around and kind of get into some of the cool nerdy details that really make this story come alive. So let's jump in. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Critical word there, worship him. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. We'll come back to that. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet was written. He's reflecting back on to Malachi, which we'll talk about. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I may too go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped where the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. We'll come back to that word too. Verse 11, this is where we landed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Very popular story. I mean, if you're around uh, the States and you know Christmas, you've heard elements of these stories, but there's a lot to this story that has either been exaggerated or um, kind of some myths that are kind of just been blended in. So I want to go back to the beginning. I want to kind of tease out and see what does this mean to us in this series as we worship the king. So verse number one, back to the top. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of the king of Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now let me, like, let me just kind of give you some context. The magi, uh, or wise men as some of us know, it's this, these are this group of people that uh, the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians at some point uh, gave them this title because they were known as wise men. A little prophecy, a little astrology, a little like dream um, kind of interpreting. But they were the wise men that you would go to if you needed wisdom for something. It's kind of a mixture of God and humanism and, and probably a little, little evil thrown in there. But they were seen as people many times that they would go to to get direction on something in life. Now, there were some of these that were God-fearing wise men. They were people that uh, helped pr progress the kingdom of God. If you think geographically, these, these men, these, these, this whole, these villages would be in the Iran-Iraq area, just east of Israel, west of Israel. And so the story goes, as we know, Jesus was born. And on the contrary to what you may think, they weren't traveling to see baby Jesus uh, in a manger. They were seeing Jesus uh, a year to two years after he was already born. And they realized that the Messiah, the Son of God, was born, came into this world, and they were going for a mission, one mission only. That was to show worship, to present worship to little baby Jesus, the Messiah. These magi, these wise men, you know, we, we, we kind of threw out this idea of that there's three of them. We three kings of Orient are, the song goes. But really, if you really think about it and really look into the story, there were probably dozens, maybe a hundred or two men that traveled and they were on horses, they were walking, they came with a lot of stuff. And so here come this whole group of people going into this foreign land, going to Jerusalem to say, hey, where is the Messiah? Where is he? So this is kind of the idea of the Magi. And let's keep going here, verse uh, 3. It says, when, the King Her uh, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all of Jerusalem with him. This word disturbed uh, is, is the Greek word terazo, which means fear from within. Gripped with fear of oneself, fear from within. So let me just kind of tell you, this, this King Herod guy, 
He was a bit of a savage beast. The way that he would reign is he reigned with fear. And there were huge consequences for the littlest things. In fact, uh, history shows that he actually put his son to death because his son was gaining a little bit more power. History shows that he actually put his wife to death because she was more popular. And with the wife, he also put the mother-in-law to death, of course, because you, you can't have one sticking around. If a, if a group of people disobeyed him on any level, they would, he would just put them to death. And so not only was he disturbed, it says Jer- all of Jerusalem was turned over, was in shambles because this group of men, these wise men came and they didn't just ask for directions. Hey, can you point me towards um, wh- where this baby's gonna be born? My GPS isn't working. As they came into the city, like, like, they, like the story says, they basically were challenging his kingship, his ability to see and know what was going on in his town. So as they come, they're asking where the Messiah is. And so Herod just flipped his lid. He, he, he grabbed everybody he could that he knew that could help him. I mean, they were challenging the very, uh, his very existence, why he is on that throne and what he does in that land. And so it goes on to say is, when he called together the people's chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. He says, I'm going to bring my boys. I got somebody. They're going to come, and we're going to tell you where. And there's a reason why we're going to tell you. In verse 5, it goes on to says, in Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet was written. Like, duh, go back to 5. Like, duh, don't you know this? You're the king. You should know what the prophets say about what's to come. And, Israel, I mean, and, and Herod is there probably just just stricken with, with anger and frustration, ready to kill somebody. And he says this. He comes up with this scheme. Let's go. He's going to, in verse 6, it says, But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea. 7. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd. Look at the imagery here. The shepherd. Who shepherd? Jesus, my people of Israel. Next verse. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time and the star that it had appeared. Verse 8. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And soon as they find him, report to me so that I may too go and worship him. So you see what he's doing here. He's scheming. He's coming up with a plan. He's like, just go and find these guys. Report back to me. I want to go and worship with you. But really what we see is, is a man... That is, as, as, as evil as you can, you can find, his kingdom is challenged, his pride is challenged, his dynasty is being challenged by these wise men that are coming and saying, we knew that he was here, duh, why are you, why, are you, why don't you know this? And as he comes up with this plan, he's like, I'm going to go worship him. I'm going to go worship who he is. And we see the, how evil a man could be, even in terms of what we do and what we worship, how, how he, could, he could come up with this plan that could possibly change history. Many times when I read stories like this, I kind of come up with a scenario. What if this wouldn't have happened? What if, what if this decision would have been different? Could you imagine what would have happened if this whole, this whole first part right here, finding Jesus? Because what happens in the story, and we don't have enough time to get into it, is the second part of this, Herod then tells everybody in the whole area, all of Jerusalem, hey, we're, gonna, we're just going to take care of this. Everybody two and under, find them and kill them. And so he's out to get this Messiah, the person that God is sending, because he thinks he's greater than all of humanity. And he says he's going to go and worship him. Next verse. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. Verse 10. And the star they had seen, went to ro- when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was, Jesus. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Overjoyed. When I, when I read stories like this, it challenges me to kind of put myself into this. So we see that these wise men, these magi, they were coming with one agenda and one agenda only. That is to, to come and worship the king, the Messiah. Generations have been talking about this. Rabbis have been traveling and talking about this for years. They've read the old scrolls. They know what's going to happen. And finally, it's happening. They see the star. They follow the star. And they know that this is the moment in history that everything will change. And so we have to bring everything we have. In fact, we know it so much. And I don't know the past history of these rabbis or these wise men or these magi. I don't know what they've been through. But they know it so much that they know this. This is your first fill in the blank. They know that worshiping Jesus produces joy. They know it so much that they put it in the story. Worshiping Jesus produces joy in your life. Where have you come from? 
What has God done in your life? What have you come through? I know for me, like, I, I, I probably shouldn't be on this stage. I really probably shouldn't even be serving God because of the upbringing, some of the things in my life. If it would have taken one little turn, I don't even know if I would be serving God. There's some addictions with, with my family and, and some of the areas that we've, we've navigated through. So I know that I have so much to look forward to when it comes to worship. I know that I can come into an atmosphere just like this and I could sit back and say, man, I got so much I got so much to worship Jesus about. I got so much in my life. You're in this crowd right now. Some of you have given your life to God in this very room. Some of you have seen marriages, your marriage restored through this, through this church and through this season. Like think, like when you come into God's presence, you should be overwhelmed with his joy because of the saving grace, because how he sets you free, because of the path that you have in the future through him. Worship has its ability to bring joy. Think about Sunday mornings like corporate. We do everything we can to give you an opportunity to celebrate God, to celebrate him. This past year, both campuses went through worship leader transition, and we went out and found the best of the best of the best so that on Sunday mornings, we can have a party. Like, we can throw it down for Jesus. Like, we can worship. And so my challenge is, you, are you celebrating those moments? Like, do you walk into a service like this, even though it's raining and it's chill, but you know, I'm going to worship Jesus today. We got choir, we got, I mean, you, who never knows, maybe next week we're going to have back lips and fireworks, you never know. Are we celebrating? Every Sunday should be a celebration of joy as you enter into a worship environment. That's what Sunday mornings are for, joy. Maybe it's, let's flip the script, maybe it's you driving to work tomorrow morning. You just wake up and just have one of those mornings where you're just bummed. We all have them. Man, put on some worship music. I mean, change the environment, change the atmosphere. Start singing these songs, start confessing these songs over your life. There's a whole gospel song that I love, and the, the, the chorus is something like, put some praise on it. And it goes, if you need a breakthrough, if you need this, put some praise on it. And if you like gospel music, I mean, you just can't, you just can't sit still and listen to this, like chill. Like, you have to celebrate. Put some praise in your life. Put some joy in your life and see what God does. And that's what these magi were, were suggesting, that worship is a party that worship throws joy into your life. Now moving on, uh, verse 11, it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented with him the gifts. This is the, these are the popular gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So I'm reading this, and I'm being challenged as I'm reading this story this week because they, the magi, the wise men come and we don't see a lot of details. Like, here are the details. They, they, they sought out to find the Messiah. They found the Messiah. They worshiped and that's it. They presented gifts. So my challenge to myself, my challenge to you is that next fill in the blank, is worship enough? Let me explain this. Is worship enough? If, if you didn't feel his presence again, if you didn't have those moments in your car, from, you know, your car in the shower, wherever you worship, because I worship in the shower sometimes. If you didn't have those moments in a corporate setting at a night of prayer and worship where you're just overwhelmed with God's spirit, if you didn't hear his voice again, is worship enough? That's a challenge, right? Could you still serve him? What is your faith uh, based on? Is it on the sovereign move of God that he is so good that you know eternity is your destination? Or is it this, this do, I, do you need to feel him every single day? And here, here's, here's the contrast. Here's the good news. God doesn't stop there. We serve a God that shows through scripture that he's constantly meeting with you. He's constantly meeting with his people. So we're made in his image and he desires to have that intimate relationship, that back and forth. It's not just a one-way conversation. It is back and forth, this, 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 this kind of romance, this, this relationship back and forth with him. And he meets us. And there's so many scriptures, there's so many stories. Take one, a couple of the popular ones. There's a story in the book of Acts chapter 16 of Paul and Silas. And there, there was a day where they were, they were doing ministry and they cast the demon out of this little girl. And the government officials, the local officials hated it. And so they grabbed him and threw him in jail. And the quick of it is, it was late at night. It was dark, it was cold, it was quiet, they were lonely. They probably felt abandoned, but they didn't try to buy their way out. They didn't try to convince the guards to let him go. They just grabbed hands and they started worshiping and Acts chapter two, uh, 16 says that the whole room started to tremble and shake. 
And all of a sudden, the walls and the bars started falling down. And God delivered them out of their situation because God is enough. Because God desires to meet you. What, what is your redemptive story? What do you have in your, in your story? Or better yet, it's a question. Here's a question for you. The next one in the place. Never come to worship or a statement. Never come to worship empty-handed. Never come to an opportunity like this empty-handed. But that doesn't, I'm not suggesting you, you bring luggage with you, you bring stuff with you, but what are you bringing in your heart as you're presenting? Because there are times in worship where it's not the time to ask for stuff. It's not the time to pray. It's just time to lift up your hands and show glory where glory is due. I mean, the Magi knew this. Like, what's, what are you bringing in these opportunities? We have... A Sunday morning, the beginning of your week, not the end, opportunity every single week to start off with worship deep in your soul. It's real easy and many times to go through the emotions. We've, we've, we've all done it. You just kind of come in and, I don't really like this song. I don't really like this one. I'm just, I'm tired. And it's in those moments where it's like you can get God's attention by just, sit, just pushing a little deeper, bringing something a little deeper in your hands. Famous story of Moses, we know that, that he, was, he was the man that God used to, to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of Pharaoh, of the uh, slavery and oppression. And in this, right in the middle of this story where God was coming to this man and saying, I'm going to use you, Moses did what everybody else would do when God's telling you to do something. Well, how am I supposed to do that? What, am I, what do I have? How, who am I? How can I deliver the people out of Israel? How can I do this? And God just simply says, what's in your hand? And we know that the story says he would carry a staff and he said, put, and God just simply said, put that staff before you, and I'll make a way. Sometimes it's the obvious. So here are three obvious, real fast, at the end of your uh, worship notes here. What do we have to offer? Certainly have time, don't we? We all have time. We all have time to offer. I mean, look at what's right in front of us. We've got Parker Street Ministry as a church that we can jump in and get our hands into doing ministry you got opportunities all around. We have mission trips that we do. We have, we have moments for you, for you to spend your time doing. I mean, uh, we are a portable church, and uh, as uh, at the risk of sounding like a sales pitch, we set up, tear down. Babies are taken care of. You guys serve in an incredible way. Hey, there's time. There's, there's moments for you to jump in and serve and give your time. Time is easy. So what are you putting your time to? Like, like could you use it in a better way that would become worship? How about talent, number two? Some of you guys are incredibly talented in areas that I, I could never, I could never get up here and sing. I asked to be in the choir. They said no. I mean, it's just not happening. I, I may jump, but they said no. You have gifts. And let me tell you if, you, if you, if you're still trying to figure out what that gift looks like, where's your talent? Hey, we have a way. We have an on-ramp for you. We simply call it Next Steps. And it's a two-hour class that we have where we help you discover your, your gifts, your talents, your spiritual gifts. And we set you free so that you can change the world around you, both in your neighborhood, your, your jobs with your family, and through this church. What are your talents? Like, what are your gifts? It's, it's always, when somebody comes to me as a pastor and says, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I say, well, what do you love to do? I mean, God gives you desires that become what you do in your life. He gives you talents. So if you have a talent in area, use it. And third is this, your treasure. Your treasure. The Bible talks over 800 times about money and, and giving money. 800 times. I think God knows that it's, it's an area that can easily corrupt our hearts. The Bible talks about it. So where's your treasure? Where do you... Where do you what do you put that money towards? Maybe about 10 years ago, I was in Chiapas, Mexico, in the mountains. We were doing a trip to the Sotzio Hebo, and we're in this little tiny village, this little tiny church. Five people showed up. I mean, our American team, there were more Americans than there were Sotzio people. But this little lady at the end of service just slowly walked up and put a bag of eggs on the stage and walked back. You know what that is. I mean, that's her... That's her that's her gift. That's her tithe. That's her, that's her treasure. And I just remember that, and it marked my life, and I thought, man, I got so much to give to God. Like, where are your treasures? This is the Christmas season. We've got needs all over the community. Odds are in your neighborhood there's a single mom. Odds are there's somebody that needs help. Look, my wife and I made a decision 
uh, not long ago that, you know, if, if a need comes to us, we really kind of don't need to pray about it. It's, it's a yes. If we can do it, it's yes. Like, we know that God wants us to be, um, be him. Like, be him to everybody that comes around us. Where are your treasures? Like, what do you have in your hands as you walk into this Christmas season? Because Christmas, you know this. Christmas can either be self-centered, all about us, all about Santa, the gifts. What do I got under the tree? Do I really got to go and see my family this Christmas again? Or it can be about what can I give? How can I leverage everything that I have to make sure that my life reflects worshiping the king? That's the Magi story. That's our story. Can we worship the king with everything we have? And that's the challenge that I have for you today. Don't miss any opportunity. Not an opportunity without realizing that you have everything to give to God today. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'd like to pray for you as we conclude this part of service. Maybe you're here and the worship component of this service is easy. That's, that's your call. You figure that out. You, you, you wrestle with this and find out how can I be a better son? How can I place God on that throne? But maybe you're here and you've never even committed your heart to Jesus. Maybe you're like, man, Ryan, I don't even know what's going on. I love this. This is great, Christmas and everything, but I don't even know where I stand with, with God. Can I, be the, can I help you today? Can I be the person that helps you walk out of this building knowing that you're forgiven, completely restored with your relationship with Jesus Christ? He's not looking for perfection. There's no perfect person in this church. He's just looking for a heart that surrenders and says, I'm open, God. And like we said earlier, he, he made a way. And, He sent his best, Jesus Christ, his son, to die on the cross so that we can have a way to him in eternity. Maybe you're here and you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. And I'd love for today, I mean, what an incredible Christmas season it would be if you gave your heart to Jesus and committed your life to him. When nobody looking around, heads bowed and eyes closed, a personal moment between you and God. You say, that's me, Ryan. I I need to ask Jesus to come into my heart. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up right where you're at? And you can put it down once you've raised it. Just slip your hand up right where you're at. That's right. Right where you're at. Awesome. 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 Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this amazing day. God, we're so grateful that we can walk into a building just like this. Because you're alive and you came into this world, we can meet you. We can worship you. We can interact with you. We can experience you, God. So my prayer today, God, that as we conclude the service, is if there's anybody here that has never committed their heart to you, ever invited you in, God, we do that right now. We whisper, God, come into my heart. Jesus, come into my heart. I give you everything, my past, my present, my future. I give it all to you. We worship you and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name.